Uh, Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, tonight I rise to speak on the principle of freedom of speech. Uh, I believe there is no democratic value or individual freedom more greatly valued and off-cited in the modern Western world than the right of free, free speech or freedom of expression. And arguably, it is the cornerstone value of all modern democracies. At its core, democracy is an agreed way of distributing and organising the political power of its citizens. However, there is no single agreed definition of democracy or indeed two identical democracies in the world. But the foremost consistently recognised fundamental tenets of democracy are representative government, political and legal equality, the rule of law and the rule of and freedoms. Freedom of expression is one of the most coveted freedoms for those who do not have it. And today far too much blood is still shed in seeking what we take largely for granted here in this country. But in Australia I believe this is a right that is not always very well understood and certainly not very well often discussed. And certainly the inherent reciprocities or responsibilities that go with this right are rarely discussed or acknowledged, and I believe this is ultimately at the detriment to us all. And indeed, it is not uh, an indicator of a very healthy democracy. Our own unique liberal de democratic culture recognises that society is improved by individuals thinking for themselves, imparting their views, and having them contested in open and often robust debate, so that good ideas can gain traction and bad ideas wither away and die, and that the changing social norms are reflected in, in the legislation of the day. But just because we espouse individual liberties and freedoms, it doesn't mean that we should ever be complacent about them. As we know, freedoms are never fully free, and as a society we routinely and, I argue, increasingly accept limitations on them. And we are often oblivious to the individual restrictions as they occur and the cumulative impact of those restrictions on us individually and more collectively as, um, as us as a society. So I believe a healthy representative democracy must foster and encourage diversity of thought and allow robust public policy debate. The current debate on section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act is a small but I believe important part of a much wider debate that we need to find a way in Australia to now have sensibly and robustly. In our election platform last year, the government committed to amending prohibitions on inciting racial hatred to focus on offences of incitement and causing fear, rather than causing offence to better preserve the right of freedom of speech. I strongly endorse and support this approach. However, Last month, the Prime Minister announced that the reforms to the Act were off the table in order to preserve national unity and to reduce complications associated with the new counter-terrorism proposals. Mr Acting Deputy President, I fully understand and support the Prime Minister's actions on these matters. And I know that this government remains deeply committed to its, freedoms, to its freedom agenda, which includes advancing measures to protect freedom of speech, freedom of religion and other traditional rights and liberties. However, I strongly contend that it is precisely the national security issues cited by the Prime Minister which make it even more important today that we find a way to engage in a robust and free debate on where the balance should now lie between freedom of speech and, in this case, and other freedoms and national security restrictions. This confluence, if not collision, of two principles most Australians would say on an individual basis that they strongly support, that is freedom of speech and strong national security policies, I think is, is actually a perfect opportunity for us all to learn more about the issues and engage in the debate on how we can balance them most sensibly in this nation. Look, even if it's just having a good old-fashioned ding-dong around the kitchen table on where this balance should lie on an individual basis and what we individually think, I think that would be a good thing for this nation. And there are several reasons for this which I'd like to outline. I believe this discussion now is particularly important because in Australia we have few constitutional protections, explicit constitutional protections on individual liberties. 
beyond freedom of religion in section 116. And I also believe in the absence of comprehensive civics education in Australia today, many Australians are likely to assume that individual freedoms are a given and that any restriction would be seen as undemocratic or unconstitutional. But as we know, no freedom is ever truly free and unrestricted. I, I suspect many Australians may also assume that we have the equivalent of the First Amendment to the US Constitution contained in their Bill of Rights. But in fact, our Constitution does not have an explicit First Amendment equivalent to enshrine the protection of freedom of speech. But there are very good reasons why we do not have a, a similar Bill of Rights. I think in this debate it is important to understand the reasons for this, as I believe the relevance is just well, I believe the reasons are just as relevant today, if not even more important. While our own founding fathers studied the American model very carefully, they chose not to adopt it fully. So in our constitution, we do have a similar separation of powers between the legislature, the executive and the judici judiciary, but we did not adopt the equivalent of the US Bill of Rights. The reason for this is that the Australian colonies were governed under a system of responsible government, where the executive government is not formed independently from the legislature, as it is in the United States. Instead, our executive is formed by elected representatives by the Australian citizens. So, While our founding fathers were passionate about freedom of speech and greatly admired uh, what was contained in the US Constitution, in Australia, they did not want to curb legislative actions on individual uh, liberties. This was because they understood that once you codify human rights, you make it easier to limit them, and that without legal definition, words can eventually take precedence over the espoused values and ideals that sit behind the words. In fact, Robert Menzies noted in the 1960s that the men who drew up our constitution believed that such constitutional limitations or checks on legislative actions were, were in fact profoundly undemocratic because to adopt them would demonstrate a lack of confidence in the will of the people. While on first blush this argument may appear counterintuitive, responsible government in, a democracy, in our democracy is regarded as the ultimate guarantee of justice and individual rights. Therefore, it is up to all Australian citizens to defend these rights. However, to defend these rights and maintain the strength of our own democracy, it's important that all Australians understand these rights and their responsibility that's contained within them. And as President Franklin Roosevelt said, democracy cannot succeed unless those who express their choice are prepared to choose wisely. The real safeguard of democracy, therefore, is education. When any of us express our right to, ex to an opinion, or when you express your opinion to me, I have to accept that I might not agree with you, and indeed it may occasionally offend or insult me. And conversely, the reciprocity is that when I speak, you have to accept that you may not always agree with what I say, and that indeed it may occasionally offend or insult you. And I argue that this is actually a good thing, if not a great thing, for our democracy. There is a quote, rightly or wrongly, attributed to Voltaire that just about you know, all of us will be familiar with, and that is, I do not agree with what you have to say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. While this is often cited, I think few of us probably really understand its implications and the reciprocity that's inherent within it. That is, all citizens have, the, citizens have the freedom to think what you want and to freely say what you think. But like every rule, it always has exceptions. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights states that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedoms to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media regardless of frontiers. But as we, as we know, in any democracy it's always a matter of balance and our freedoms are never truly free. 
and that in a democracy and in our democracy we trade off individual rights for the collective good. But it must never be done by force or achieved through community ap apathy or occasionally simply inattention. I believe that as, as a community and as a society we have to rediscover a way to accept hearing things we personally do not believe in, because if we do not, when it comes to speaking out on things that are important to us, no one else will hear you. John Stuart Mill's harm principle holds that no one should care about what anyone thinks, says, does or how they behave, as long as one isn't encroaching on other people's privacies and personal liberties to live a free life. I believe Mill's views remain just as relevant today when assessing what is and what is not free speech and also informing us how to regulate free speech if it is likely to lead to disorder. But as a basic principle inherent in that, I think for us all, is that we don't need to moderate free speech. Instead, it's behoven on all of us to moderate ourselves. Today it appears to me that many of those who most vocally assert their right of free speech do not exercise this corresponding responsibility of allowing those who disagree with them to similarly engage in free and frank debate. And I've learnt that in public policy debates there are those who speak to prophesize and are not open to opinions expressed by others. There are also those who speak, but not just to be heard, but to hear from others, to learn from others and to challenge their own thinking and points of view. As uh, Noam Chomsky noted, Goebbels was in favour of free speech for views he liked. So was Stalin. If you're really in favour of free speech, then you're in favour of freedom of speech for precisely the views you despise. Otherwise, you are not truly in favour of free speech. And I would argue you are simply in favour of your own right for free speech and not for everybody else's. The section that has triggered renewed and recent uh, and often pub passionate public debate on this topic were the government's proposed changes to section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act 1975. Section 18C itself makes it illegal for someone to do a public act which is reasonably likely in all the circumstances to offend, to insult, humiliate or intimidate someone on the basis of their race. Senator Day, in moving his bill today, noted that for the rule of law to function properly, a country's citizens must be able to observe, comment and critique the existence or non-existence of laws, the making of laws and the application, therefore, in the court system. These freedoms are so critical to the very existence of a strong democracy and an acceptable way of life, they are even recognised in international treaties and conventions, to which Australia is both a party and an adherent. And when view, reviewing any legislation, including this, uh, this bill, the intent and context is always very important. And it's my understanding that when the Act was passed in 1975, the intention was to prohibit racial discrimination in accordance with the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. However, subsequent amendments to the Act have extended its reach to the point where many, including myself, believe it has created a serious imbalance between freedom of speech and racial discrimination. At issue today in Senator Day's bill is that Section 18C of the Act restricts even objective and fair-minded opinion and expression uh, common in the Australian community. The amendments proposed by Senator Day to remove the words offend and insult appear minor particularly as the words humiliate and intimidate remain. But as I noted, if this bill is passed, sorry, but as I noted, um, words are always subjective and therefore contestable. And while many, might find, many in the community might find these words illegal, legalistic or technical, the implications of these four words are important for all Australians to understand, not just in the context of the Racial Discrimination Act, but more widely in the discussions on freedom of speech. As the drafters of our constitution noted, words can often take precedence over the intention or the value that sit behind them. And while senators on this side of the House may not regularly turn to Julian Burnside uh, 
for inspiration on uh, legislative matters. Uh, on this matter, I find his opinion most instructive. Mr. Bernstein is, Mr. Burnside is quoted that the mere fact that you insult or offend someone probably should not of itself give rise to legal liability. My personal view is that 18C probably reached a bit far, so a bit of fine tuning would probably be okay. And that the idea that speech which insults a group is arguably going too far. In fact, the diversity of view within the Australian Human Rights Commission itself reflects the wide range of opinions in the community on this issue, and therefore I believe this issue has a long way to go in the Australian community. So, in conclusion, Mr. Acting Deputy President, um, I do commend Senator Day for bringing this bill forward and encouraging debate on what I hope will be a far more wide reaching uh, debate and discussion in the com Australian community on freedom of speech and the balance between our individual liberties and national security uh, restrictions. So tonight I've shared my views and my thoughts on these issues and I encourage all Australians to engage in this debate both privately and publicly because as your elected representative in our own unique form of uh, democratic government, I need to know your views and I need to know whether I share your views or whether as a community you have views that are different from mine because that is my role as your elected representative. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President.